Stanford University. Okay, we're back here for lecture three of Stanford's CS193P for spring of 2021. Last week, we learned a lot about how to build UIs using Swift UI. This week, we're going to learn how to hook up our UI to the logic that actually knows how to play the card matching game. But first, I'm going to cover these two really important conceptual ideas. MVVM, which is a way of organizing all the code that goes into our application, and the Swift type system, which obviously enables everything we do in the Swift language and thus in Swift UI. So let's talk about this MVVM thing first. It's a design paradigm that makes it clear where all the different components of your code go and how they interact with each other. Now, Swift UI pretty much does not work without MVVM, or at least if you build a Swift UI app without MVVM, it would be pretty bad. By the way, if you're familiar with the old way of building apps for iOS before Swift UI, MVVM is a different thing than MVC, which is how we built those apps. So don't confuse those two things. But MVVM does share some things with MVC. Most importantly, it separates the user interface code, what we call the view, the purple rectangle there on the right, from the back end or logic of our application, which we call the model, the blue rectangle. By the way, it might be a little bit confusing that we call that purple rectangle the view, and then we also have those things called view in our UI code. Basically, the purple rectangle, capital T, capital V, the view, is made up of those view things. So let's talk more about these two things, model and view, and the mechanisms in MPVM that hook them up to each other. First, the model. The model is completely UI independent. For example, Swift files, right, Swift code in our model, they do not import Swift UI. Now the model captures all the data and logic that describes what your application does. The view is how your application is presented to your user, but the model is what your application actually is and does. So in the case of our card matching game, this includes all of the cards, obviously, that's the data, and it includes all the decision making about what to do when the users choose cards, that's the logic. What makes a match? How many points do I get for a match? What happens if I choose this matching cards, etc.? All of this logic and card data lives in the model. And only in the model. The model is the single source of truth about the data that represents our game. We are never going to store that information anywhere else but in the model. For example, we're never going to copy it into variables that live in our user interface code. We won't have an is face up at sign state bar in our view anymore. Okay, that was just demoware from last week. We would never copy the value of whether the card is face up or not from our model into some at sign state bar in our view. Instead, we're always going to ask the model if we need to know whether a card is face up. That way we never have to worry about the two versions of the truth that need to be kept in sync somehow, like about whether a card is face up or not. The view is therefore always going to be a reflection of the current state of the model at all times. So for example, whatever cards we see on screen in the memorized game are the same cards that are currently in the model, always. This means that the view is pretty much stateless. It doesn't need to store much in the way of state because all the truth about the state of things is in the model. So when do we have state in our views? Those at sign state bars in our Swift UI views, presumably those are states since it's called at sign state. There must be some reason to have that in our views. Well, any information we store in one of those at sign states will only have to do with how the view is managing itself. For example, in our game, there's a way to choose a theme, Halloween theme or vehicles or whatever. The top level view that chooses a theme probably has at sign state in there to keep track of which theme is currently chosen, just so it knows to redraw the screen if the user picks a different one, etc. But the information about the games themselves would live entirely in the model. 
by the way, these themes are editable in our memorized game. We can change the name of the theme, which emojis are in the theme, the color of the theme, and there'd be a model for a theme as well. Now, a large application can have many different models and of course, dozens or even hundreds of views. But the choice of which theme is active is temporary. It's transient state that's just part of the view's internal mechanics. It doesn't represent anything about the, what this application actually does, namely it plays a card game. It's only involved in how the games are displayed on screen. These assigned state bars are never holding the cards or the score or any information about the games. They're just facilitating transient movement in the UI. In the demos we did last week, we spent all of our time writing code for our body bar. That body bar must always return something based on the current state of the model, always. That's what it does. That's almost the definition of the body bar, return a UI that reflects the state of the model. Now the system could ask for the value of that body bar at any time. And there's no other way to draw on screen. And views are immutable. They can't be changed. So there's no other way to modify our view other than to rebuild the entire body. Therefore, 100% of what a view looks like is solely determined by what's in the implementation of its body bar. Nowhere else. And no when else either. The only time your user interface is constructed is when the system grabs the value of your body bar. We call this kind of coding declarative because we're declaring what our view's UI looks like in its body bar end of story. Now this is as opposed to the kind of coding you're probably used to, which is imperative. In an imperative approach, we're calling functions one after another that are piecing the UI together over time. Then again and again over time, we're calling yet more functions to modify the UI as the user interacts with it. But each time, we're hoping that we don't make a mistake that puts the UI in some bad state or out of the sync with the model somehow. Now, for us to ensure that this imperative code is going to work proper, properly, we pretty much need to anticipate every possible path through every function call that could affect our UI state, which is pretty much impossible. In a declarative approach, we only have to look at one place to find the code that draws a view, its body bar. And we only have to think of one path through the code accessing the body bar. The system will never interact with our view in any other way than asking for the value of the body bar. And again, it might do it at any time, but we don't care when we're asked either because we're always gonna be looking into the model at its current state in the implementation of our body bar. So our body bar is kind of time insensitive. Basically what you see in a body bar is exactly what you get in the UI. And the only way it can change on screen is to redraw the whole thing. This locality of the code, right? All the code lives entirely in this one place, a body bar, and the locality of time over which the UI is built, it gets built all at once, not drop by drop over time, is why declarative coding is so well suited to user interface programming. As you can imagine, it results in code that's easier to write, easier to read for sure, more reliable, and more provable. Okay, by provable, you mean can you prove that it does what you intend it to do? For this to work though, it does mean that every time something changes in the model, you now have to ask all the views that depend on that change for their body bar. Uh, whoa, uh, for that to be practical, you have to have a system that's very efficient. It must only ask for the body bars of the views that actually can change as a result of that latest change to the model. Otherwise, you'd be redrawing your UI constantly, your entire UI. This is what MVVM is all about. And this is why, in addition to being declarative, we also say that Swift UI is reactive. The view is always automatically reacting efficiently to changes in the model. 
Uh, at its core, you know, MVVM's job really is just to hook up the models to the view so that any change in the model will cause the affected parts and only those affected parts of the view to be rebuilt by accessing their body bar to show that new state of the model. So how does this reactive stuff work in MVVM? Well, it's all facilitated by this third element, the view model. The view model's job is to bind the view to the model so the changes in the model cause the view to react and get rebuilt. Along the way, by the way, it's, as it's doing that, it can also serve as a sort of interpreter between the model and the view. Our model in this memory game we're writing, it's really simple, it's just a struct, but you can imagine your model is a SQL database or maybe it's data coming over on the network or making HTTP requests or something like that. It could get quite complicated over there in the model. Now we want the code in our view to be as simple as possible. We're writing it in this nice declarative way so we don't want it to be gunked up with lots of data conversions and network calls and database access. So the view model does all that cleans up all that gunk for us if we're a view. For example, a view model might present the data from a SQL database model to a view as an array, or it might convert integers in some model to floating point numbers or something that the view would prefer. When we look at the functions and the bars in the view model that the view is allowed to call, they should be tuned to be, quote, exactly what the view needs, end quote, to do its work. This is why we say the view model interprets the model for the view. The view model also serves as a gatekeeper for the model. It ensures that access to the model is like well behaved, especially when it comes to changing the model. And we'll see this uh, in a moment. This interpreting and gatekeeping happens naturally because of an important rule in MVVM. The view must always get data from the model by asking for it from the view model. Now, the view model never stores the data for the model inside of itself. The model is still the truth. It always is the truth. But the view model is just an intermediary that's passing the data along from the model to the view, perhaps cleaning it up or interpreting it as it flies by. But having this rule that the view always has to go through the view model puts the view model in a great spot to help with this reactive mechanism we talked about that's so important to making all this work. Okay, so how does it do that? Well, first, a view model is constantly noticing changes in the model. Now, it can do that any way it wants. If your model uh, is a struct, like we're going to have in our memorized game, uh, then it's very easy. Swift has the ability to automatically track changes to a struct. We're going to talk about that when we talk about the Swift type system. If the model were, let's say, something more complicated like a SQL database, I don't know how much you all know about SQL databases, but it's quite easy to insert something into the database which notifies you when there are changes. Or if the model were something on the network, then obviously there are ways to get you know, woken up when data appears from the network and the view model could do that as well. But however it does it, it's obviously a must in MVVM that the view model be able to track all changes in the model. That is fundamental. Now, when the view model does notice a change, it immediately publishes something changed to the entire world. And anyone who is interested can listen for these pronouncements. Why does it do it this way? Okay, why does it say something changed to the entire world? Well, for a very important reason, the view model does not want to have any connections to any of the views that are using it to access the model. This is a very important point. We never have a pointer or any other data structure in a view model that knows anything about a view struct. Okay, It does have a general idea of how views might want to look at the model's data, of course, because it serves that interpreting function we talked about, but it has no connection to any specific view ever. And that's why it publishes to the whole world something changed. It's up to the views to sign themselves up to listen for these change announcements. The terminology we use here is that the views are subscribing to what the view model is publishing. And what it's publishing is something changed in the model. So when Swift UI sees that a publishing event has happened for a view that is subscribed to that view model's announcement, it asks the view for its body var and redraws it. 
when the view is providing that body var, it is, of course, looking at the current state of the model, and it's doing that through the view model. So that way the view model can do its job of interpreting the model data for the view. That's it. Simple. To make all this easy to set up, when a view sets itself up to access the model through the view model, it does so in a way that it simultaneously subscribes to the announcements that the view model is making about changes in the model. Therefore, it can never be out of sync with the model. We'll go through all of these view setting itself up to access the model through the view model mechanisms this week in demo. I put some of the keywords involved here on the slide so you can refer back to it. I'll put them up again at the end uh, of these slides. Now, what about the other direction? Okay, we talked about how the view is always finding out about changes and being rebuilt to show the latest state of the model. But how does the model get changed by touch events happening in the view? Right? Taps, swipes, navigating around in the UI. Presumably, some of that is going to cause the model to change. We handle that by adding another responsibility to the view model, processing user intent. We say it this way because users are essentially expressing their intentions to change the model through these touch events. And so we add functions to our view model, which allow the view to say, oh, the user just did something in my view, and by doing so, she intends the following conceptual thing to happen in the model, whatever. This thing that the user intends there is something a user understands. It's the user's intent, after all. Then the view model translates those intentions into specific modifications to the model. Uh, for example, uh, in an application where the model is, let's say, a travel server with flight and hotel information, a typical user's intent might be something like, book this vacation. The user's intent is not something like, contact travel server to confirm previous reservation with this ID and pass the data structure along to it, uh, et cetera. Okay, the view just calls some simple function in the view model like book it, since that's the user's intent. The view model does all that other stuff as part of its responsibility to facilitate communication between the view and the model. Now, it's not actually required to handle taps and swipes and stuff from the user in this way with these intentions. Um, in other words, there's nothing about MVVM or SwiftUI that enforces this. It's not a formal mechanism built into the system. There's essentially no model view intent architecture in SwiftUI, although such things do exist in other systems. But thinking about things this way, this intent way, is highly recommended. It's a very kind of clean way to think about what's going on in your view and how it should be affecting your model. Now, occasionally it is true that our model might not really be anything more than just pure data store. In other words, there's very little in the way of user intent other than just edit this directly from fields in the UI. A view model in this case brokers access to the model mostly by just making the model, uh, you know, the data in the model more public than it might otherwise be. We often call view models to facilitate this sort of direct access to model a store for kind of obvious reason, right? We're just storing data in the model, nothing more. There's no user intent other than that. So sometimes we won't have these explicit user intent functions in our model per se, but if we do take this store approach, we want to be careful that we don't end up starting to put code in our view, which is translating user intent into data store access. Okay, that sort of code wants to live in the view model, not in a view. And if that started to happen, we'd want to add those that user intent as functions in our view model instead. So the bottom line here is that simplicity and declarability are key to good view design, and that good view models support that, both with the way they present things via their interpreting function, but also by pro providing really sensible intents for the view to access. All right, so the view expresses the user's intent and the view model changes the model, then what? Well, all the stuff we talked about earlier. The model changes as a result of those intentions being expressed. The view model notices these changes. It publishes the fact that things have changed to the world. The view has already subscribed to those changes when it originally signed up to get the data. So it notices and the system redraws by getting the value of the view's body bar again. 
That's the entire MVVM architecture. I've put Swift keywords back up here again so you can look at them as we go through our demos this week where we're going to apply this MVVM architecture to Memorize. But first, let's take some time to talk about the Swift type system. It's really hard to truly understand any Swift code without understanding the system of types that underlie it. Now, there are essentially six major different kinds of types in Swift. There's structs, like our content view and our card view. Our memorized model, by the way, is going to be a struct. There's classes. Of course, that's object-oriented programming. Our view model is going to be a class. There's protocols, super important type, view, like some view or behaves like a view. That view, that's a protocol. So was identifiable. Remember the thing with the for each where we wanted things in the array to be identifiable? That also is a protocol. There's don't care types, also known as generics. We'll talk about those. Enums are just enumerations, but very powerful in Swift. And finally, functions are types. Yes, as you might have figured out by now, functions are first class types in Swift. That's fundamental to having a functional programming language for functions to be first class types. Now, this is a big topic, so I'm only going to bite off these four types today. We'll talk about protocols and enums uh, a little later this week or next week. All right, struct and class. Now, these are very similar, so I'm going to talk about the things that are the same about them first, and then we'll talk about the things that are different. So what's the same? Of course, they can both have stored variables, okay, variables that live in memory, like is face up colon bool that we had in the demo. That's just a normal variable that's in the struct or class. Nothing special about that whatsoever. There's also computed variables, variables whose value is computed from some inline function. We saw that with the body var, most important var probably in all of Swift is a computed var. Uh, they both can have lets in addition to vars. Lets, of course, are just constants. Okay, like variables, but they don't vary, they're constants. Um, and they both can have functions. I'm actually gonna take a brief time out here to talk a little bit about the syntax of functions. Uh, not the all, everything there is to know, but the basics so that you can understand the code that we're writing and that you're seeing. You know already that the arguments to functions are labeled. In Swift, right? They have these labels. For example, we have multiply function here, and it's got two arguments, the operand argument and the by <laughs> argument, and they both have labels so that when you call them, the bottom line there, multiply operand colon five by six, you have the labels. That way, if someone reading the code knows what those things are. But it's kind of can result in a little bit of a goofy situation like we see here, where inside the multiply function, we have return operand times by. Okay, B Y, but you really don't want that by that. It's kind of like operand two or something like that. That that not good. So actually, in Swift, we can have each of our arguments have two labels: an external label that callers use and an internal label that we use inside of our code. So in this example of multiply, the purple things there, operand and other operand, are the internal labels for these arguments. And then the blue things, the blue by right there, and there's actually hard, maybe hard to see, but there's a blue underbar right before the purple word operand there. Those are the external names. Let's look at the external names first. Now when I call multiply, I just say multiply five comma by colon six. So the second argument there by, you see how it has by as the blue argument, the external one, and then internally it's other operand, and that's what we're using inside our function. Now the other argument, the five there, the one that passed the five, it has underbar as its external parameter name. Underbar means don't have one. So that's how we're seeing a lot of functions like foreground color and padding have their arguments not even have a label. They put underbar as their external name. And then in both cases, we use the pink, and so that the inside of our code return operand times other operand looks really kind of cool. These things of having external name, internal name, we're gonna use that all the time to make it so that callers, the call reads kind of like English, multiply five by six, and then inside of our implementation, of course, the variables will have sensible names. 
both structs and classes also have initializer. So initializers are special functions. They're called init. You don't use the word func with them because they're implicitly funks. And init is just the function that gets called when you create a struct or a class. So remember, rounded rectangle, corner radius, colon 20. That almost certainly was an init somewhere in rounded rectangle struct that lets you create it. And you probably had another init, init, corner size, colon something. And you can have as many of these inits as you want, and they can have as many arguments as you want, and they can all be different arguments. And that way there's a lot of flexibility to create the kind of initialization that you want. So we'll be seeing inits today. In class, for example, uh, we are going to have our memory games initializer be initialized with the number of pairs of cards in the game which is kind of exactly how you would think of creating a new game. How many pairs of cards are we matching in this matching game? What is the difference then between a struct and a class? Well, there's actually quite a few differences. So I'm going to go through them one by one because they really affect how you program in Swift. So let's talk about the really the big difference is that structs are value types and classes are reference types. So what does this mean? A value type is copied when you pass it around or assign it to a variable. Literally, a copy is made. Whereas a reference type, you are passing pointers to the thing around. It lives in the heap, in memory somewhere with a pointer to it. And when you pass it as an argument to a function or assign it to another variable, you're just passing the pointer to it. So everybody's getting a pointer to it. Lots of people have a pointer to that thing. In Swift, that instructs rather that never happens. Every time we pass this as an argument, the person gets a new copy of it. Now, this might seem a little ridiculous passing these things, but what if I had an array of 10,000 items? I'm really gonna copy that entire thing every time I pass it to another function? Well, not quite because structs also implement something behind the scenes called copy on write, which means you don't actually get a real copy of that array of 10,000 things until you modify it, start removing or adding, adding things to it. Now, kind of by the same token, in the class world, you're kind of thinking, well, when do the things in memory ever get cleaned up? I got all these pointers to them. They live in the heap. When do they get cleaned up? Now, in other languages, they have things like garbage collection to clean those things up and stuff like that. We don't do that. We do something way better in Swift, which is automatic reference counting, which just means that Swift is keeping track of how many pointers exist to something in memory. And as soon as that goes to zero, or no one points to it anymore, then it removes the memory from the heap, which is really, really cool. But you can see the structs and classes, fundamental different way of thinking about the storage that goes into a struct or a class. And the struct way, this copy on write, this value type mechanism right here, copying things every time you pass them around, is really at the heart of functional programming. In functional programming, we want to make our programs provable. We want to make sure they're going to work. So we can't be passing around our data by passing it by pointer and just hoping that nobody damages the thing it's pointing to. We want to be able to ensure that it's working. In object-oriented programming, kind of a different model there. We're not so worried about that. Uh, it just was designed at a time where that was not as much of a concern. And certainly passing pointers to things around does make programming easier in some ways. And it actually also does facilitate something that you do sometimes need in, in code, which is sharing, right? If I have some data structure and I want to share it, then passing a pointer to it makes a lot more sense than passing a copy to it all the time, especially since it's going to copy on write. And if I pass a copy to someone and they edit it, now they have a you know, different copy. So that's not so good for sharing. But object-oriented program is good for sharing. That's, by the way, why our view model is going to be uh, a class, because we want to share it amongst all of our views. Now, structs don't have inheritance. That's just not a thing for structs, functional programming. Uh, it's really not about inheritance. Uh, you know, Swift is more about protocols. We're going to talk about next week, uh, but there's no inheritance. And in Swift, uh, the object-oriented model, these classes have single inheritance. Some of you may have experience with languages that have multiple inheritance. Nope, not in Swift, single, normal single inheritance. Both of them interestingly get a uh, free init. 
So we talked about those NITs in the last slide to, for initializing a structure, a class. They're quite different in NITs, however. A struct in NIT has an argument for every single variable that's in your struct. And of course, if you've given them default values like is face up equals false, okay, then you can skip it if you want, you can put it or not. Uh, but that way, when you get use this free initializer to initialize a struct, you can ensure that everything can get initialized. That's really awesome free init, believe me, it's awesome. Uh, by the way, if you give your own init to a struct, now you lose the free init. <laughs> that free init only happens if your struct has no custom inits that you write. So something to think about there. Now the free init that you get for class is quite almost the opposite. That one takes no arguments and initializes none of your variables. So you might think that init is kind of useless, but you can imagine a class where you've set is face up equals false. And maybe you said content equals smiley face if it was a card view class or something like that. So you've initialized them all. You could imagine that and thus an in, a free init with no arguments, eh, some value. Anyway, it's a very different approach there to free inits. Structs, super important feature of them is that mutability, in other words, whether they're modifiable, whether you can add things to the array, remove things to an array, because array is just a struct, is explicitly stated, okay? It's made explicit in the code, and the way you do that is with var, versus let. If you put something in a var, an array that's stored in a var, you can append things to it. If you put an array in a let, then the function append doesn't really even exist in array for that array. That's really important thing to understand is that whether something can be mutated or changed uh, depends on whether it's var or let. Now, you remember I told you that the structs like content view and card view, those are structs. And I told you that they're immutable. Well, essentially what that means is that the entire data structure of all the views is stored in a let somewhere. It's not in a var, so they're not mutable. And that's very common to put things in let. In fact, in a struct, we're almost always going to try to design our code so we don't have vars. We don't tend to mutate structs in place. It does happen, of course, you have arrays, you need to add items to them. but Occasionally, we'll add items to array by taking an existing immutable array and adding another immutable array worth of stuff to it to get a third array, which is the combination of them. That, that's really not even unheard of. So in the world of classes, very different there. It's always mutable. You have a pointer to this thing in the heap. There's nothing stops you from calling a method or changing a var on that thing you have a pointer to. And that is really wild west okay for classes as part of why functional programming uh, in a way is much more provable you just it's just too wide open on the class side so you want to be careful on the class side that if you are using classes like we're going to do for our view model again uh, that you're using it in very well understood ways and that you protect it's API, the functions that are being called on it so that, you know, none of the many people who might have a pointer to something can break it in any way. Now, in our view model, we're going to have very clear methods like intent functions and stuff like that that cause changes. Uh, and that in that way, we're going to be very controlled about how people can mutate uh, our view model. Uh, strokes, given all this, struct uh, is kind of your go-to data structure. I mean, to be honest, functional programming is newer in the world of programming models uh, than object-oriented programming, or at least it's more newly being adopted. And it has distinct advantages. Uh, you, you know, that's why we're going to do struct as our go-to. Uh, classes we're only going to use in specific circumstances, like, again, when we have a very strong need for sharing things, we might do that. Of course, if you're importing a bunch of object-oriented code from something else that's already been written, no, yeah, Swift is great. It will let you uh, do that. But uh, for the most part, uh, structs are your first, at least the first pass, you should try to design things using structs. So everything that you've seen so far in this class, the entire demo last week, all structs, except view, I guess. View is a protocol, obviously, but all the things that were actual data structures uh, we're all structs. 
And the only class you're really going to see in this entire course is view models of MVVMs. Now, there's going to be quite a few of them um, over the course of the quarter, but uh, that's basically the only uh, classes you're going to see. Uh, UI kit, which was the way you built iOS apps before Swift UI was invented a couple of years ago, it's class based. So almost everything there is a class. It, it's doesn't, it didn't really have structs when it was invented, uh, or at least not the kind of structs we use in functional programming. Okay, so hopefully that gives you the feel of struct versus class, a very important distinction uh, in, in, as we develop things in Swift UI. So that's why I spent uh, some time on it there. All right, next kind of type is these don't cares. Now, why do we want types that are, we don't care what they are? Well, we might want to manipulate certain data structures that we're type agnostic about. We don't know what type it is and we don't care what type it is. But the problem is that Swift is a very strongly typed language. So we don't use variables that have unknown type. There are languages out there where it's like you have a variable and it doesn't really have a type. And if you put a string in there, okay, it's a string. You put an int in there, yep, now it's an int. Swift has a type like that, but it's really for backwards compatibility almost with UI kit. Uh, it's not a, a type that we really use in Swift. So we want everything to have a strong type. That allows the compiler to look at our code, analyze our code and see if it's likely to work, <laughs> okay? Um, so how do we specify the type of something when we don't care what its type is? That's just kind of weird. Uh, well, we use a don't care type. Now, this phrase don't care type, that's the phrase I use because I find when students are learning about these things, that's a good phrase. Uh, the actual feature is called generics. Um, that's what's called in other languages. Java has generics, so this is not that foreign. Um, but I call them don't care. So if you hear me call don't care, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so let's learn this by example. Array. Array is the world's simplest to understand use of don't care type. Because an array contains a bunch of things, and it doesn't care what type they are. It could be an array of integers, it could be an array of strings, whatever, it doesn't care. But array still has to have an API, it has to define its functions, like, you know, a function that adds an item to it or something like that. It has to, how does it even define it if the type of that argument, add this item, it doesn't even care what it is. So that's really what we're talking about here is how does array kind of implement itself to be generic like that, where it you know it can have any kind of type in it whatsoever. Well, that's what this generic mechanism lets you do. So let's take a look at kind of pseudo code here for what the declaration of array somewhere in the Swift uh, libraries looks like. It says struct array. So far, this is just like struct content view or struct card view. But then there's this angle bracket element, and then the open curly brace. So it's that angle bracket element that introduces the don't care type element to array. This element array can call it anything it wants. It just made up this name element. And that is now a type that's only used in array and array doesn't care what it is. It can be anything. So now inside array, we can define the function append. It takes one argument called element, which is of type capital E element. And so that's array saying, yeah, you can append something to me. It has to be a type of element. I don't care what that is. Simple. So that's how we do don't care. We just put that angle bracket thing in our declaration when we're being uh, declared up there. And that's it. We just invented it. Now we can use it anywhere uh, that we want. Now, when array implements this uh, append method or whatever, it doesn't know anything about that element. It's just throwing it in some internal data structure. It, it, it's not any known struct or class or protocol or anything. Uh, it's just a placeholder for a type when it's used like this. Now, the code for using an array, you've already seen that in the demo, looks like this. Var a equals array of int open parentheses, close parentheses. So when I created this array, I had to say, this is an array of int. 
Now we did that in our demo, we had an array of string, our emojis, remember, were an array of string. We ended up not having to even say array angle bracket string because Swift inferred it from what it saw in the array, but we saw that the declaration of the type was array angle bracket string. This one is array angle bracket int. So it's when you use an array that you declare what type that don't care actually is. So now element is int. It's almost like as soon as we say var a equals array angle bracket int, we're doing search and replace on the word capital E element throughout all of array with int. And that's essentially what is happening. It's not actually what's happening, but conceptually that's what's happening. And that's why we can then say a dot append five or a dot append 22, because the append function, which takes something of type element is now taking something of type int. And that's it. There's really nothing more to that. It's really an awesome system to be able to do it this way because now the compiler knows that elements of this array right here, this array called A, are a type int. So we can make sure that when you typed A dot append five, that five was actually an int. It can type check what you're doing. Now note that array had to let the rest of the world know about the names of its don't care types, obviously, because we're going to have to specify what they are when we use it. It is legal, by the way, to have multiple don't cares. Array only has one, but you could have other structs. You can imagine having multiple don't cares perfectly allowed. Now we're gonna talk a lot more about uh, them later. Uh, one thing I do wanna say about generics is that the official name of that thing element is actually a type parameter. It's not really called a don't care. And yeah, that's just something uh, I made up. Um, uh, Swift combines generics uh, with protocols to make really powerful features. I mean, spectacularly powerful features, right? So uh, we're gonna talk all about that next week. The, the generics I've showed you so far, are just the absolute basics. It gets a lot more powerful than just, you know, being able to have something like an array with things in it you don't care. Way more powerful than that is down the road. The last type I want to talk about is functions as type, right? Functions are people too. Well, functions are types too. Uh, you can declare a variable or have a parameter to a function or whatever whose type is a function. The syntax that you do to make this work includes the types of the arguments and the type of the return value. And you can do it anywhere any other type is allowed. Okay, you can have a type as a function. Now, we saw this all over the place last week. Right, we were passing functions to things all over the place. Z stack had its content thing. We passed a function on tap gesture had performed. We passed a function in there for each created things. We passed a function. That function even had an argument to it. So passing functions to other functions, that is the heart of functional programming. So what are some examples of doing that? Here is in yellow, a type, which is a function that takes two integers and returns a bool. That's what that type is. Here's another type, a function that takes a double and returns nothing. That's what arrow void means, don't return anything. Here's another type, which is a function that takes no arguments and returns an array of strings. Perfectly legal, right? And here's another one, very common one, a function that takes no arguments and returns no arguments. So this is like the argument to on tap gesture. That's what it is, a function that takes nothing and returns nothing. These are all just types. Now, since they're just types, I can, for example, declare a variable to be of type function that takes a double and returns nothing. That's what foo is. Foo is foo could be an int, but it's not an int. It's a function that takes a double and returns nothing. That's what foo is. Or I have a function called do something, and it has an argument with the label what, and that what argument, its type is a function that takes no arguments or returns a bool. This is what it looks like to have functions be types in a language. This is something I understand that a lot of you are going to be like, mm, what? Mm, not a lot of languages do this, okay, where they treat functions as such first class citizens. But again, I can't say it enough. This is functional programming. This is absolutely mandatory if you have functional programming to have this kind of mechanism. So let's see how we use some variable that is of type a function. So here I have a variable operation and it is of type 
a function that takes a double and returns a double, uh, what am I going to do with it? Well, first let's define ourselves a function that takes a double and returns a double, okay? Like square. Square takes a double operand and it just squares it. Operand times operand returns a double. Okay? So that clearly we can all agree that is a clearly a function that takes a double and returns a double. So of course I can say operation equals square because operation is of type function that takes a double and returns a double. And of course square is a function that takes a double and returns a double. Now, how do I call that function through that operation variable? I just say, looks almost just like calling a function normally. Operation, parentheses, 4, and that would make result 1 be 16. Now, there's notice a slight difference there. When I call operation, I don't use the labels, the operand colon label. You see square the function has operand colon as the label. So you skip the labels when you're calling a function through a variable that is of type function. So that is a slight difference uh, there. But the cool thing here is I could then say, oh, now operation equals square root. Okay, square root is just a built-in function in Swift that takes a double and returns a double, so this is perfectly legal. Now, if I say result two equals operation of four, I get result two is equal to two, okay, instead of 16. So you can already start to see the power of having variables that are type function. You can start assigning them to different things that, uh, that match. So we're going to uh, have a function inside of our demo that takes as an argument a function. You'll start to see how we use this on the, on the uh, back end of it here. As you saw last week, when we have a function that's an argument to another function, many times, most of the time maybe, we pass it in line. We just open curly brace and here comes the code. Okay, We don't define a separate function like square and pass it that way. We just put it right in line. We, do, we did that all the time last week with the stack and uh, all those things. We just passed it right there. This kind of inline function, we don't really call it inline function. I call it that just because, again, it's new to a lot of you and it does look like a function that's like right in line there. Really, we call them closures. And they're called closures. There's a reason why we're going to talk about it probably week, next week or the week after, something like that. It, those, those functions capture some of the state and the environment that they're in. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about that right now. You can think of them as inline functions, but really the right word for them is they are closures. Okay. So yes, functions as types are very important in functional programming. Uh, so that's why Swift makes them so easy to use and such a kind of front and center part of the language. Right, that is all the architecture chatting I wanted to do. We understand now what MVVM is. We know about some of the most important kinds of types in Swift. So now we can jump back into our demo and use it all. Okay, most importantly, we're going to apply MVVM to our card game and give it some logic so we can actually play the game. And along the way, we're going to do all the things you see in this slide right here. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you can refer to it later. So let's get started and um, add MVVM to our memorize game. Our goal for this week is to get our app to actually play the game of memorize. We're going to do that by applying this MVVM thing we just talked about to our app. Before we dive into that, though, let's remove the minus and plus buttons, same as you did in your homework, because we're clearly not going to need that for our app. And let's take a look in the simulator, make sure we didn't break anything. Still working great. That's wonderful. Everything we've done here, though, was really just UI prototyping. We haven't done anything towards playing the game. Even the var is face up that we put in here so that we could click on the cards and have them turn over was only in service of seeing what the card looked like when it was face down or face up. When it comes to the code that matches cards and gives us points and all that, none of that's going to live here in our UI. We're going to put that in its own place, our model. 
I'm going to hide this preview over here because the code that we're going to write in our model is going to be completely UI independent. So the UI is not going to be changing as we do that. I don't think we showed how to do this last time, but it's pretty easy. It's this little button right here. See it has show editor only canvas. And there's some nice keyboard shortcuts here that you're going to get used to like command return to close this. Anytime we want to add code to our app via Swift file, we're going to do that by going to File, New, File. There's a lot of choices here because of this cross-platform, but under iOS, really only two of them matter. This one, which is a generic Swift file, that's what we want. And also this one down here, Swift UI View, which just gives you a little bit of template of our body that's blank if you're building a view. But here we're definitely not doing user interface. We're just doing basic UI independent Swift code. So we want this one. Now it's asking you what you want to call this file and where you want to put it. We're going to call it memory game or model. Usually we want the files in our model to be describing exactly what our app does. Our app is a memory game playing app. So we want to call it memory game. And also we want to be careful about where we put it. I want to put it in the same place that our other files are. So if this is not selected, you probably want to select it and put it in the same place at contentview.swift and memorizeapp.swift are. And similarly down here, this group, those are the groups that were in the navigator. This blue group is the very, very top level of our project. We usually don't want files in that group. We want to put them in this yellow folder, memorize. When you build a big app, you're going to have lots of folders to choose from here, but you almost never want to put files right up in the project, no matter how big or small your app is. So let's put them in this memorize folder. And here it is. Here is our model. Let's put it with the rest of our files in the navigator. And notice that it says import foundation here. That's quite different than our content view, which said import Swift UI. This said import Swift UI because we're doing UI here. This does not say Swift UI because we're not doing UI here. We're doing just basic Swift. This foundation package in Swift is array, string, dictionary, the basic structs that you need to build your app. It's not buttons or view or any of that API that we used when we were building our view. Our model is going to be a very simple struct memory game. Your model, of course, could be much more complicated. It might be some huge network database with information. It's Facebook it has a gigantic model. Your app is not necessarily going to have one huge model. It might be made up of lots of kind of small models that combine together. And that's the role of the view model, to either take a really large complicated one and create small windows on it, or to take a bunch of small little models and combine them together to have a unified window on them. So models are important in terms of how they're built, but also view models are important for presenting to the view a decent, easy to use view on a lot of little models or one big model or some combination thereof. When it comes to designing your model, you just want to think, what does this thing do? In a memory game, what does it do? Well, there's cards. You choose the card. It matches them, gives you points. So we're going to have to have something in here like some cards. I'm probably put them in an array. Array of what? Array of card. I, I just invented this. It hasn't done really exist yet. I'm going to get an error there because of it. But I'm just trying to gather my thoughts here about my model and what it does. My model also can choose cards. So I want a function that the argument is probably going to be a card. This is the first time we've seen a function in Swift. Let's take a little pause to talk about it. Really simple syntax, func, keyword, the name of the function. And then the arguments here, they can be multiple arguments separated by commas. If you had a return value, you would just have arrow with the return type, like int maybe, or string, or whatever. We don't return anything, so we don't need that. 
These arguments can have labels like this. I'm going to take another time out from our time out to talk about these labels. It's really important to name these well. In fact, in your reading assignment, in the very last page, there's a reference to a document you have to read which talks about the art of naming these things well. Making your code understandable to other people reading it is really a lot about choosing good names. Good names for these parameters, good names for functions themselves, good names for variables, good names for structs. Let's analyze our choice of calling this card. I just kind of typed that in. I was trying to gather my thoughts on my model, so I said choose a card, a type card. This is probably not actually the ideal name here. If you read that document, you'll see that if the argument to a function is of a very clear, explicit type, like card, in other words, it's not an int or a string or something like that, then it's usually not necessary to have a keyword which is just saying the name of the type again. It's kind of redundant. If someone sees the code for choose a card, they're going to see that this argument is of type card. It's not going to add much to their experience to have this extra keyword. So this is a case where we might want the external name to be blank, no keyword, so that readers are seeing choose something in here that's of type card. It's pretty clear, especially in the context of a memory game struct, that that's going to choose that card. This kind of attention to detail here might seem like uh, it's nitpicking or something like that, but it's actually not, especially since you're just learning this and you want to get in the habit of choosing really good names. Of course, all that we've done here has been referencing this card, so we need to represent a card in our game somehow. I'm just going to add a struct for that. I'm going to call it card. Notice that I put this struct inside this struct. Structs inside structs. What does it mean to put a struct inside another struct? Mostly, this is a naming thing. This card is actually called memorygame.card. That's its full name. Of course, inside of memory game, we don't need to say memorygame.card here. We could if we wanted to. It's not an error to say that. But we're clearly in the context of a memory game. It's pretty obvious which card we're talking about here. But people outside of this code are going to have to say memorygame.card. Now, why do we do this? Why do we namespace this card here? If we took this card and put it outside like this, this would work. The code's still going to compile. But now we have this struct whose name is not memorygame.card, just card. What if our app played Memorize, but it also played poker or some other card game? Which card is this? This is not the same kind of card that's in a poker game. So by nesting this, we make it clear that this is a card that goes in a memory game. What's a memory game card made of? Well, clearly going to have to have some sort of is face up. We got to know whether the card is face up or not. And now that we're actually playing the game, we're probably going to need something like is matched to know whether the card's been matched. And very importantly, we need to know what's on the card, the content of the card. Now, we're building an app where the contents of the cards are emojis. So you might think, well, let's just make this a string, and then we can put the emojis in there. But I think we can do better than that. What if we wanted to enhance our app or build a better version of our app in the future, where instead of emojis, we had arbitrary images on there? Then this content wants to be some sort of image structure or something like that. Not clear what, or maybe it's a JPEG, or I don't know what this thing is, but it's not a string at that point. Our memory game is UI independent. It really doesn't care what's on the cards. And so this is where we want a don't care. I'm gonna call this type card content. I just pulled that out of my hat. I just made that up. This is a don't care. Remember that if we use a don't care, we have to announce that to the world by putting it in angle brackets up here. Why do we do that? Because when someone uses our memory game, they're gonna have to 
tell us what this don't care is. This can't be a don't care all the time. It's only a don't care when we're talking about it in our code because we don't care. But whoever is using us certainly cares. And when we do our emoji game, it's going to make this be a string because emojis are represented by strings in Swift. And believe it or not, I think that's it. That is our entire model. Of course, we have to implement choose to make it play. But I don't think there's anything else going on in a memory game than this. So now we can move on to the next part of MVVM, which is our view model. Again, we're going to go up here, file, new, file. And while our view model is part of our UI, it's not a Swift UI view. So I'm going to choose Swift file, hit next. We have to think of a name for our view model now. Our view model is part of the UI. It's not part of the view, but it's part of the UI. And specifically, our view model plays a kind of memory game, which is emoji memory game. So I'm going to call my view model emoji memory game. I'm going to put it in the same group here. I'm going to make sure it's in the same folder as the rest of the stuff. Here it is. Now, this emoji memory game, it's importing foundation, but I told you it's part of the UI, so it can actually import Swift UI and has to import Swift UI. It's part of the UI. We've been using structs for everything so far. Our view is a struct, our model is a struct, but our view model is going to be a class, object oriented. Call it emoji memory game. Classes in Swift, of course, can have inheritance. You specify the inheritance by just saying my super class or whatever your super class would be. This looks very similar to what we have with the view, behaves like a view. But since this is a class, this is actually a little different. This is a super class. That's not the same as behaves like. Although it is possible for a class to also do behaves like. You know, something we behave like. And they can do that even if they don't have a super class. But our emoji memory game for now doesn't behave like anything and it has no super class. Our view model's job, if you remember from the slides, is to be an intermediary between the model and the view. So it needs to have a connection to the model. And in fact, our view model is going to create its own model. That's not always the case for a view model. Again, sometimes the model is a network database that already exists and it's just going to connect to it. But many times it creates the model that it provides the window on. And it's the view model's job to either make that thing persist on disk or on the network or something, or it's the kind of thing where the game just goes away when this view model goes away, which is going to be true for our emoji memory game. While you're playing it, it's there, but when if the view model goes away, then the game is over, it's gone. Because a lot of view models create their own model, a lot of times we will say that the view models are the truth in our app. If you remember in MVVM, we said the model is the truth, and it is. But the view model, if it's creating its own model, it's essentially the view model itself is the truth. It stores that truth in the model. But if you hear people say, oh, I'm creating this view model, it's the source of truth for my UI, that's not an unreasonable way to look at it as well. Again, our model is just a struct, so I'm going to make a var called model, and it's going to be of type memory game. But you see we get an error here. A reference to generic type memory game requires arguments in angle brackets. That's a very good error. That's exactly what's going on here. Memory game is generic over card content here. So if we want to create a memory game, we have to say what type the card content is. In this case, this is an emoji memory game. So 
these are strings. Our emojis we're going to represent as strings. Before we tackle this error that has shown up right here, I want to talk a little bit about the view model's role as gatekeeper to the model. What do we mean by that gatekeeper? It's the view model's job really to protect the model against ill behaving views or anyone else really who has access to the view model. And one of the ways we do that is by making our model private. This keyword private, you're going to see and be typing a lot. Private means that only the view model's code itself can see the model. That protects the model against any view reaching in and trying to change things. And we're going to talk about this private more in the future. It's part of what we call access control. But the basic idea is we want to make our vars and our funks really private unless we're sure we want to allow other structs and classes to access them. Sometimes though fully private is a little too restrictive. For example, in our memory game, people really do need to see those cards. How else is our view going to draw the cards if we can't see them? So there's another private called private set. Private set tells Swift that other classes and structs can look at the model, but they can't change it. So they can't, for example, call this choose function because that would change the memory game. And most especially, they can't reach into the cards and start changing is face up, is match, these kind of, they can't change these, which makes sense, right? If you just went in and reached into these cards inside your game and changed is face up to false, you wouldn't get points or penalty or nothing would be actually happening in terms of matching. So we do not want to allow that. So it would definitely want to at least have a private set. If it wanted to make it fully private, then it could make the cards available another way by just having its own cards bar. And this cards would be an array of memory game of string dot card and it could return the model's cards. This, of course, is completely read-only because this is a var whose value is calculated by a function, so we can only get the value. There's no way right to set the value of this through this. And now views could call the view model's own var to get the cards. And why do we make this cards var in our view model be the kind of var that we get its value by executing a little inline function here. Well, the cards in the model are a struct. They're an array of card. Both arrays and cards are structs. When we pass structs around, we copy them. So if someone's going to ask the view model here for the cards in the model, we're going to have to get a fresh copy. So that's why we want to ask the model for its cards with this little inline function every time someone asks us for those cards in the view model. You might go this route if there were other things besides cards in your model that you wanted to protect your view from seeing. You don't want them, you want to be the gatekeeper and keep them from looking at those. And so you keep the entire model private except for the things that you make public. But you definitely wouldn't want to have this bar not be private. It's just too wide open. It's allowing the views. If a view had bad code, they wouldn't change the model directly by looking at change in the cards is face up or is match or something that could break your entire game. By the way, the model can also use private to protect its cards from the view model. You'd almost certainly want private set here. Under no circumstances would the model want anyone to touch the cards except for to look at them. And that's what private set does. It says you can look at these, but you cannot touch them. The only way these cards are going to change value, there is face up or is matched, is in this choose function. When we get back to the UI later, we'll see that we can use private in the UI as well to protect things. All right, what about this error we got here? Class emoji memory game has no initializers. Hmm, what does that mean? Has no initializers. Well, this is actually saying that you have a var here that has no value. And we learned over here 
in our view that we can't have vars that have no value. Now with structs, if you have a var with no value like this, that's no problem because when people create the struct, they can just give the value of it. That's one of the cool things about structs. But that is not true for classes. Classes, you can't do that trick. So in classes, all the vars have to have some value. They have to be equal to something. Or it would have to have a special method called init that would initialize these variables. We'll talk about this special method init in a second. But first, what would be the value of our model here? How would we create one? Well, let's say memory game of string. Let's just create one. That should fix our problem. Oop, missing argument for parameter cards in call. Oh no, this memory game of string is a struct and it has an unset variable here. This doesn't have any value. So since it's a struct, we're getting the opportunity here with this error to say cards colon and give some array, but wait a second. Okay, that is not right. We, we don't want to force people who are using the memory game to create the memory game's cards. This is a memory game. It should be able to create its own cards. So we are gonna need an initializer here. We're gonna need one of those special functions I talked about, an init that initializes these unset variables here. Now we know that init can have whatever arguments you want. And we can even have multiple inits with different arguments. But I can really only think of one thing that a memory game wants to know when someone is creating it, which is the number of pairs of cards. That's all we need to know. If a memory game is told how many pairs of cards, it can go off and create these cards. And it can do that by just saying cards equals array of card empty so that create this creates an empty array of cards and then here we're going to add number of pairs of cards times two cards to cards array once we do that we'll have fully initialized ourselves here now that we've provided an init the init where we would set the cards is gone in a struct, once you provide your own init, you lose that free init, the kind of init that we used here to create a card view where we got this content. We don't have an init here, you notice, but we still got to do this. Kind of got a free init there. We don't get that once we give our struct an actual init. Now that it has an init though, over here, we can say memory game of string. And when we create it, we say, number of pairs of cards, let's say four. And now this code looks fine, it compiles without error, and this one also compiles without error. Everybody's happy. All we need to do is do this. Let's use a for loop to do that. We haven't seen how to do a for loop in Swift, but it's pretty straightforward. We just say for the iteration variable, I'm gonna call it pair index, in, and now we can specify anything here we want that we could for loop over. So this could be some sort of array here, or it could be a range. Remember a range? We had a range back here in our UI when we were getting a little sub slice of our array. We specified this little syntax, which is a range that goes from zero up to, but not including emoji count here. I've made a range that goes from zero up to, but not including the number of pairs of cards. And inside here, pair index is gonna start out being zero, and then the next time through, it's gonna be one, and then two, and then three, until we get up to, but not including the number of pairs of cards. In other languages, this for loop will look something like for pair index equals zero, pair index is less than the number of pairs of cards, uh, pair index plus plus, this would be a for loop in other languages, C or whatever. No, we don't do that. There's no such thing. There's only for in. But for in is very powerful because when you're doing a for loop, you almost always want to do it over a range or an array or a set, or even you can do a string and it'll go through the character. So it's very powerful syntax for in.
what do we want to do for each of the pairs of cards? We'll just add a card to our array. So cards.append, that's how we add something to an array. Card, let's create a card. And luckily, it's a struct, a card to struct, so we get this free initializer is face up. I well, we probably want our card starting face down. Certainly, they start not matched. Oh, uh oh, card content. <laughs> hmm, well, I'm not sure what we're going to do about that, but I do know that we want two cards. This is a pair of cards that we're doing. We're really close here. We've gone through and added a pair of cards for that many pairs of cards, but we're a little bit stuck because how do we create the content that goes on the cards? This is a don't care for us. How could we possibly create something? Well, we don't even care what type it is. We don't know if this is an int or a string or an image or some raw bag of bits of data. We have no idea what this is, so there's no way to create it. That's quite a problem. Before we address that though, I wanna talk about these. Every card that you create when you first create it, it's not face up and it's not matched. If the game started with them all faced up, it would be a pretty easy game to play, right? So we don't need to specify these, which is nice because it cleans up this code dramatically where we're just creating the cards with the content. What I need is something like maybe a variable here called content which equals something, and it's going to be of type card content. And then I'm going to take this content and put it on both cards because these two cards are going to be matching cards in the game. I just can't get past this part right here. I, I don't know how to create a content. And in fact, I shouldn't have to know how to create it because it's a don't care for me. Whoever is creating this memory game, they know how to create one of these. Back here, we're the emoji memory game. We know that we're going to put emojis on these cards. So somehow we have to be involved in creating those cards. This is where functional programming comes in. We are going to create a function. I'm going to call it create card content. And I'm even going to pass this pair index to it, iteration variable as we're going through here. And this function is going to create the card content for these two cards. So where does this function come from? Well, it's going to be an argument to this function, create card content. And what type is this? It's a function that takes an int and returns a card content. This is a very powerful little piece of Swift code right here. We're passing a function to this function, this init function, and this function is going to create the card content that we want. And we're going to pass it the pair index just to make its life easier. It might not care, but probably it cares. It might care. We'll see. And that's all we need to do. We've solved the problem here. We have this minor warning variable content was never mutated consider let, changing to a let constant it's saying this content we didn't ever change it so it's not a var it's a let if you click on these by the way you can leave an offer to let you fix it be careful when you use fix sometimes it doesn't fix it in the way you want but this would definitely fix it the way we want change that to let one other thing we can do is that this colon card content is not necessary that can be inferred from the fact that this function returns a card content. So that means that this variable must be, if I option click on it, of type card content. We combined a lot of powerful Swift things here, right? Just in this one little function, because we're doing generics and functions as arguments together to create this very powerful generic memory game. But of course, since we've added this extra argument, that is going to cause us to have to provide that argument over here. And if I build my code, of course, we're going to get the error that we have the missing, missing argument for parameter create card content that takes an int and returns a string. And we could hit fix here and it would add it in there. And it even adds it with this little blue thing that if we double click on, tells us the type that we want. Let's give this function what it wants. It, it wants a function that takes an int and returns card content, which is string. 
I'm going to go up here and do that. Funk. I'm going to call it make card content. It takes an int, call it index, and it returns a string. This is a function that does that. Let's have it return. And for now, let's have all cards have a smiley face. So go to my emoji over here, to here, smiley face. And since this is a function that takes an int and returns a string, we can put it right here. Make card content. Woohoo! This solved the whole problem. But as I'm sure you have surmised by now, by seeing all this code in our UI where we're passing functions left and right to things, we're constantly passing functions to make our code work. Do the same thing here. There's no reason to make a separate funk out here. We can just drop it right in here. Let's see how we drop things right in here. I'm gonna put this on another line, give us a little more room. How do we take the equivalent of this and just drop it in here. Let's copy and paste this down here and see what modifications we have to make to make it work. I'm going to start the copying right here. I don't need the name because I'm never going to refer to this because I'm dropping it right in here. The reason we have names for functions or variables is so we can refer to them. But if we're just dropping them in here, we don't have to refer to them. So I'm going to copy this, go here, and paste but i do have to make one modification and that's to move this curly brace from right after the arguments and return type there to the front that makes it so that the whole thing is encased in curly braces but when we move that we have to put in the word in to separate the arguments here from the actual contents of the function if this in looks familiar, it should. We use the same thing for for each. Emoji in. So emoji is just the arguments to this function. And the in separates it from the code that actually executed, which return card view, that aspect ratio. We can do a little better here, though, by using type inference. Swift knows exactly what kind of function this is supposed to be because it's specified right here. It's a function that takes an int and returns a card content, which Swift knows that in here, card content is a string. So we don't need the types in here. We don't need the return type. We don't need the type of the argument, and we don't even need these parentheses. That's how we get to index in, or over here for our for each emoji in, from the more explicit typing that we have over here. So that's cool. And we also know we don't need this return because this is a function that returns a string. And that's the only line of code it has in there. Could put this up on this line. Also, of course, this is the last argument to a function. And it takes a function as the type. So we don't need this either. Get rid of that. and put it outside the parentheses. Woo, look at that. One last thing we can do is that currently we don't even use this index. We're always returning a smiley face. So this could be under bar in. You can't just take this away, by the way, because if you do this, this is no longer a function that takes an int and returns a string. It's just a function that returns a string. So you do need this under bar in, even though we don't you're not going to use this. And that you can see under bar in Swift generally means that it doesn't matter what's there. So now we don't need this extra function out here. And our code looks amazingly clean. But we are going to need this pair index right here. Because we're not going to always return a smiley face. We're going to return different emoji for each pair. Let's do that. Let's go grab our emojis from our view. It's not going to need them there anymore. Copy them there. It's over here. So we have some emojis. And instead of returning a smiley face, how about if we return emojis at the given pair index? 
Oh no, it says cannot use instance member emojis with property initializer. Property initializers run before self is available. Oh my, what does that mean? Well, to understand this, we're going to have to understand some of the words being used here. Let's start with cannot use instance member emojis. What does that mean? Instance member emojis. Well, instance member just means any function or in Swift case variable that's defined in your emoji memory game. Whenever I create an emoji memory game, I'm going to get an emojis and a model with it. That's all it means there. And what it's saying here is that I can't use one of these like emojis within a property initializers. What does property initializer mean? Well, the word property just refers to vars. Vars and lets inside of a class or a struct, we call them properties. You're going to hear that word property all quarter long. So what's a property initializer? That is just assigning a value to a property using an equal sign. And I'm doing that here and I'm doing it here. And it goes on to say property initializers like these run before self is available. So what does that mean? Well, self means the emoji memory game itself. So it's saying you can't call emojis during a property initializer, which makes perfect sense if you think about it. The order of these properties being initialized is random. It's undetermined. You don't know what it is. So there's no way that you can have one of their initializers depending on another one already having been initialized. So how do we get out of this mess? Because we want to use emojis, this other var, in our initializer here. But emojis might not yet be initialized. Well, there's a couple of ways out of this. One is we could use an initializer. Just like we have an initializer over here in our model, it's initializing a variable, this variable right here, by just initializing it. There's no equal something over here. We don't use a property initializer to initialize this. We use an init. So we could do the same thing here, create an init, and just make sure that we assign these in the right order. So that this was set first and this was set second. But we don't really need to do that here because of the kind of variable this is. Emojis is really not a variable. It's a constant. And this does not change in anywhere in our code. So this, in fact, should be a let. Now, that doesn't solve the problem because a let is still an instance member. It's still a variable. It's just a variable that doesn't vary. We call it constant. So how could we make it so we access this without crossing this line? How about if we take this whole thing and move it outside of our emoji memory gate? Just make it a global. So this is now a global variable, global constant called emojis. That works fine. Look, the error goes away. It's, it's kind of okay, I guess. This is a constant, so it doesn't depend on anything in here. So we could just do this. However, as you probably learned when you were learning to program, Global variables are not good. Global state could be used by anyone. It pollutes the namespace there because emojis is now a variable everywhere in my entire app. And it means an array of these vehicle things. Nah, that's kind of weird. We don't want that. So what we're going to do here is we are going to get the best of both worlds. We're going to keep this being essentially global, but we're going to make it be namespaced inside our class and we're just going to drag it back in and we're going to put the word static in front static means this is essentially global but its name now includes this it's like a little bit like when we nested card inside of memory game and now cards real name is memory game of whatever card content it is dot card similar kind of thing here the name of this emojis is really emoji memory game dot emojis. This is its full name right here. And that solves our problem. No errors. This is now essentially a global. 
So it's not, this code is not depending on another var in our emoji memory game instance that has to be created. And we can do the same static thing with functions. For example, let's imagine I wanted this to be in its own function. Create a function to do that. Funk, call it create memory game. And it returns a memory game of string, of course. And I'll just use this exact code right here. Just pick this up and put it right in there. And it returns this. But we don't need the return because this function clearly returns something. And this is the only thing in there. So that's the same as if it was inside a var. And now I can say create memory game to create my memory game and get it initialized. But this creates an error as well. In fact, it creates the same error. Property initializers run before self is available. I can't be calling a function on myself before I'm even initialized. That's a definite non-starter. So how can we fix this? Again, there's no reason this couldn't be a global function. It doesn't depend on anything inside a memory game, except for this other static, which is itself a global. So that's all fine. Again, bad programming. Someone running across a program be like, what's this global function about? Why is that not part of this emoji memory game? And indeed, it should be. So we'll do the same thing. We're going to take this create memory game function and put it back down here. And we're going to make it static. And its name now becomes emoji memory game dot create memory game. Problem solved again. Now, the official name of these statics is type property or type variable. And this is type function. Why do we call this a type function? Why don't we call it static function? It has this word static on there. Because we're trying to emphasize that this function is actually a function on the very type emoji memory game, not instances of the type, but the type itself has this function or this variable. So that's why we call them type properties, type variables, type functions. Your reading goes over all of this. I take the extra time here to talk about these as if they were globals, because students easily get confused between something like this and something like this. They look so similar, right? It's only this one word there that's different, but these are quite different. You're talking about something here that is attached to this type. It only exists once in your entire app, it can be used over and over, whereas this is something on every instance. It creates a new memory game every time you create a new emoji memory game. This is not true. This is only created once. It's essentially a global constant. This function is also essentially a global function that is creating a memory game for you. We've actually used statics like this all over the code we wrote last week. Let's go back to our UI and see where they are. For example, how about large title? This is actually font.large title. Large title is nothing more than a static constant on the font struct. Same thing here, color.white. That's what's going on here. This is the color struct. This is just a global static constant on it. Why didn't we have to put color or font here? Well, that's our friend type inference. Swift knows that this function font takes a font of some sort. So if you say large title, it's of course going to look in the struct font to find that. One last thing we can do for code cleanliness here is it's so common to want to use a static function to do initialization like this because of the restrictions of using funks on yourself, you can't do it, that it will put that in there for you. So you do not have to specify that, but that's only during initialization or if you're already in a static funk and you're accessing another static, then you don't need it as well. But otherwise, you need the full name of this. If I had a funk down here, I'll call it foo, I said, let x equal emojis, I'm going to get an error here. And this error is going to be static member emojis, type var right there, k 
cannot be used on an instance of type emoji memory game. This is an instance function. This is function that's being sent to an instance of it. You cannot access it this way. You have to say emoji memory game dot emojis. Okay, full name here inside foo. That is it for our view model. And we've finished our view model and we finished our model. Now, we still have work to do here to make the game play, but the infrastructure of our model and our view model is in place. So now all we need to do is go back to our view and have it depend on the model. Because we know that our view's job in real life, not during this prototyping world, but in real life, this view's job is to draw what's in the model. So it's going to need to use our view model here to access our model and that's how it's going to get whether cards are face up or match or not and what content is on the cards so we'll leave off this lecture here and we'll start up our next lecture doing that for more please visit us at stanford.edu